So how's everyone doing today? Average. Average. <laughs> Average, poor, terrible, bad. <laughs> we, uh, we did about an hour and a half of uh, mediumship work this morning, which was really enjoyable, actually. So uh, when, uh, when Monica decides she would like, she's okay with it being on the net, I'll uh, put it on there for you. <laughs> Um, but in the process managed to help quite a few spirits, which was really good. Um, so um, I've had a bit of fun this morning, so I feel li all lively. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel. Who, uh, who's down Butter and Malulabar way with a triathlon on? Yeah, quite a few. Yeah. A bit hard to get up here, isn't it? You're battling around some back streets and so forth. Um, The next time we get together uh, will be, I think it's something like April the 9th or 10th or something like that. Um, one of the things I felt yesterday was that, uh, that maybe, maybe having fortnight seminars like this is getting a bit tiring for, most, for a lot of you. Is that the case? <laughs> no, it's not. Okay. Well, it's not tiring for me, but... <laughs> What I, what I notice is happening, though, for many, is that there is this sort of exhaustion of, oh, no, not more truth. Well, like, how do I cope with that? <laughs> how do I cope with the last bit that I had? Like, <laughs> and, and that is an issue that um, is very, very difficult to address, actually, where what happens is often we've received that amount of truth from a, in, in our he hearing, and obviously some of that settles with our soul, and we're yet to actually emotionally perceive that amount of truth and when we, when we get into that state, we often get into uh, states of judgment, exhaustion, tired, feeling tired and exhausted with the whole thing and all those kind of things. So just notice that happening in you. And if you notice that happening in you, maybe that's the time to just stop coming to one of these sessions, stop, stop hearing more truth, and just try to consolidate emotionally the truth you've already heard. Does that make sense? Like, allow yourself to feel about the truth you've already heard. Because if you don't do that, what will happen is that you'll get to a point of feeling just overwhelmed with the volume of work, emotion, that you'll have to do. And in the process of feeling that overwhelmed, you, you can often go off the path just because you're so overwhelmed. And many are not nursing themselves through the path. Um, I've noticed that many of you are getting quite harsh with yourselves at time about your emotions and what's left to deal with and so forth. And understand that the only way to progress on this path is to love yourself through the path. So whenever you get really hard on yourself about not doing something or not progressing in the way that you really want to, whenever that really ha happens, you are not loving yourself in that moment. And so in a way, you're just off the path again. So even though you dedicate to feeling and emotion, at the same time, you're actually off the path emotionally and it's something to address inside of us if that's what's going on. So I don't mean to overwhelm you with all these things all the time. Um, obviously, there, there is an unlimited amount of divine truth available to you. And you could uh, come along for the next five years and still hear something new every week. But the, the issue we face is hearing it is very, very different to it settling in our soul. A very, very different process. So my suggestion is if you notice yourself uh, that it's not settling inside of you, but rather it's something that's hearing you, you're hearing, but, but it's not really changing your life in, in many ways, then my suggestion is just to go back to the basics and uh, focus on the basics um, and that'll help you get through that state. And the basics are humility, longing for love and longing for truth. And so, so you'll be far better off spending your entire weekend with your family confronting the issue of truth than you would be here hearing another truth if you haven't already confronted the truth with your family. Does that make sense? And you'd be far better confronting the truth with your friends than coming along here and hearing another truth when you haven't yet confronted the truth with your friends. Do you, do you follow me? Because if, if you get in the state of hearing more and more but not actually doing it, then in the end there's, there's very little point in coming along and hearing it 
and, uh, and that's something to consider. And what happens inside of your soul when that goes on is there is a big separation inside of yourself and you feel more and more in turmoil. And w what we would like to do is have the least amount of turmoil in our own spiritual progression than adding to our own turmoil. So that's just a suggestion. And um, quite often you've noticed in the past where I've counselled a group of sessions and uh, that may in fact, actually, in fact actually happen in the future too yet um, because that's the times when I feel I've got some emotional work to do and I'm not getting through it and I need some extra time and so I just counsel a group of sessions because I'm focused on dealing with that and at times you're going to need to do the same thing as that. Just counsel coming along, can't, you know, live in your life, allow the emotions to come up and put it into practice rather than actually keep coming along hearing but not, not actually feeling any benefit to the hearing. Um, today, as I pointed out yesterday, the subject that I wanted to co cover is, uh, uh, is a part of the uh, series of discussions that I'm doing on spirit relationships. Rela here I go again. That's a T there, I-O and <laughs> ships. Right. And the sub point that I want to raise today is the issue of possession and obsession. Um, it's a subject actually that you hear a lot of stories about, isn't it? You hear a lot of weird and freaky things about with regard to obsession and possession. But oftentimes we don't understand what's really going on behind the scenes. What's really going down with regard to it? Why does it actually happen? What's occurring? And I thought perhaps today some of the things I could do is actually read a part of an autobiographical uh, autobiography of David Hawkins who, who came up with the whole scale of consciousness uh, idea and illustrate to you how spirits, through this biography, how spirits actually do connect to people and how they then influence people throughout their life and how the connection is maintained and what happens when the connection drops out. Like I said yesterday, many of us are not aware of how strongly spirits are influencing our day-to-day -day life through our emotional condition. And oftentimes, unfortunately, it's looked upon as a good thing. We were speaking this morning uh, through Monica to, us, to the, the leaders of the oneness movement in the spirit world. It's the first time they'd come to have a conversation with us. They'd been wanting to have a conversation for a few weeks now. And, and in that conversation we were talking about how many people who are in the oneness movement have actually been overcloaked by spirits in the spirit world and they are in this what people call a state of enlightenment that actually isn't their true soul condition but rather the emanations of the spirit who is overcloaking them. Um, Alex, would you, where are you? You here? If you, can you just come up here with me? I'm sorry I've not organised this with Alex and Alex is now totally confused. Um, if you can just stand there in front of me with your back towards me. I was talking to Alex yesterday about what happens with him with regard to his emotions. So what happens is if you imagine me being the spirit and Alex being himself, right? Now Alex all of a sudden is connected to me via some emotional hook that we talked about yesterday and then all of a sudden I basically enter him. Does that make sense? And now... I am actually now influencing him in a lot of ways. Physically I can influence him, I can influence his emotions quite a lot and his experience from that point on. So when Alex is like that and, and open to that happening emotionally, which because Alex is highly mediumistic he, he can easily enter this state and you've entered that state quite a few bit of times in your past, haven't oh, you? Right. Last <laughs> night as well, yeah. So what happens is the spirit then connects and now, now Alex is not sure what is his own emotions and what is the spirit's emotions. Does that make sense? You, you know that ad that's on telly? Um, have you seen that ad where there's two people working? Like it's quite a clever ad, right? It's one of the best ads I've seen. And I only saw it the other week when we were in New Zealand and I just thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. And that's almost what it's like. You've got the spirit working together with you. So, so now when we, when we spoke yesterday, I was talking about sort of the power feelings and powerless feelings and so forth. So a lot of times what we've got to do is look at what the emotion is that would cause me to feel so attracted to Alex that I can now actually manipulate a lot of his life. Does that make sense? I wanted to just illustrate that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. 
So what we want to do is uh, look at the set of conditions that uh, evolve emotionally inside of us that finish up attracting spirits to us who can manipulate us quite strongly even to the point of overcloaking us almost all the time. In other words, overcloaking us almost on an on a hour by hour basis. And what actually happens in the relationship between myself and the spirit when that occurs? Now, Many, there are many documented evidences of what I'm going to discuss with you. The only trouble is that it's all couched in different words that I'm going to talk about with you. It's all couched in words of enlightenment and becoming aware of the I am presence and all these other type of words that it's all couched in. But I'm going to, what I'm going to do today is blow away all of these myths and put it down to the actual what's actually going on and illustrate that through some examples. Now the reason why I want to do this is because so many people are totally willing to be overcloaked on a day-to-day -day basis by spirits for a lot of different emotional reasons. And the more mediumistic you become, and by the way that is a given, as you progress on the divine love path, you are going to become more mediumistic whether you like it or not, right? And so as you progress, you are going to release a lot of the fears that you have about spirit connection, about seeing spirits, hearing from spirits, about being influenced by them. And as you release a lot of those emotions, you'll now see them more clearly. You'll see what's going on. You'll see, in fact, you'll get to the point where you even see the spirits, spirit body. You'll see the emotional hook that spirit has with the person. You'll see even when the spirit is talking in the person's ear, trying to get them to actually feel something that the person doesn't actually feel, you'll see all of that occurring. Now to give you an example of that, um, when I was in Greece last, which was a couple of years ago now, we had a group of people come over, uh, as we do when we're travelling around generally, and there were about 35 or 40 people there present at one of these discussions. And there was a lady right down the end, totally sitting the opposite to myself, right down as far away as she could get from me as possible. Right? And of course that was motivated by three of the spirits who were with her, who wanted her to be as far away from me as possible. And so she was right down the end of this uh, long sort of, uh, it, was, it was beautiful setting. We were, we were overlooking a bay uh, from a person's um, balcony and there were, it was a huge balcony and able to seat quite a few people and just this wonderful setting. And she was right down the end, we were talking, it was outside and we were talking about all these different spiritual matters. There were four or five people, there's quite a few people in Greece actually who are quite spiritually connected, like it seems to be something that's quite common over there. And there were four or five people who were also in the audience who could see very clearly spirits. In fact, one of the ladies could see spirits so clearly that she actually thought they were, she saw them the same as she sees you. That's how clearly she sees them. So she, she's given up driving because, because she's afraid of running over the spirits like, and things like that. So she's going along and she, she slams on the brakes and nobody's there, but she, she sees the person standing in front of her walking with a pram across the road, you know, things like that. So she sees very, fear spirits very clearly. And there were a group of others there, there, about four others there, who could also see spirits quite clearly. And... and we had this conversation and this conversation ensued between me and this woman at the other end and then these four or five people came up to me afterwards and, says, and said, man, those spirits with that lady, they were really into her, weren't they? Now this lady had no idea that what she was saying was being spirit driven or influenced at all. She believed with all of her heart that what she was saying was coming from herself. And yet the, the lady who was seeing spirits like she can see you described the condition of each of the spirits and we just discussed it privately, the, the, the condition of each of the spirits who were surrounding this lady. Now the lady was heavily on the natural love path and these spirits were very antagonistic towards hearing any other truth other than the natural love truths. And so what, what they were saying to me, they were constantly engaging me in questions and in statements that were trying to oppose what I was teaching constantly. And this lady had no idea whatsoever that she was actually just being used as a mouthpiece of three spirits wanting to disagree with me. Now in the end, I did point that out to her, that there were three spirits with her who were influencing most of our discussion. 
and she would not accept it at all, even though five other people in the audience saw those spirits talking in her ear. So what we obviously have also, that illustrates that we obviously also have very deep reasons why we want to deny the existence of spirit connection and communication and deny the influence. You see, if I have to admit that I'm being influenced by somebody, then I have to admit quite a lot of things about that influence, don't I? Firstly, that I've attracted it. Secondly, what emotions in me have caused this attraction to occur. Thirdly, how much of my life is actually dominated by these spirits and not actually my own life. Fourth, um, the, how each interaction is actually manipulated by someone else other than myself. How does that feel? You know, there's a lot of feelings involved in me having to recognise that there's quite a lot of influence. And so the majority of people who are overcloaked by spirits do not ever through their entire life on earth admit to themselves or to anyone else what has actually happened. You know the first time that they admit to themselves something must have happened? Is as soon as they die. What happens when they die is most of them expect themselves to be arriving in the spirit world in what they classify as an enlightened state. When they arrive in the first sphere, and almost all of these people, by the way, who are overcloaked in this manner do arrive in the first sphere, there is obviously a huge discrepancy between what they expected the spirit world to be in their enlightened state and what it actually is in reality. Now imagine the shock of that. You've lived with something all of your life, believing something all of your life, believing that you were safe when you passed, everything was going to be fine, you're an enlightened being, everything's going to be fine, and then you pass and lo and behold, it's totally the opposite of what you expected. Now, many times the spirit who overcloaked the person, obviously some, a lot of the times was in a better condition than the person and so therefore made the person feel this feeling of overwhelming love for everyone and overwhelming compassion for nature and for animals and birds and all these other things and can talk to nature, talk to the animals, talk to the birds and all those kind of things and also be able to express themselves very fluidly when they're on earth. And you imagine all of a sudden at the point of passing that all of those abilities pass from you. You imagine the shock of that. Like it's a terribly shocking place to arrive and there's terrible emotions involved in that and that's why I f feel pretty concerned about a lot of the things that have been happening on earth with regard to what we believe to be good that actually turns out for a spirit when they arrive in the spirit world to be bad or to be very painful experience for them. You wanted to ask a question? If we have a mic, uh, there's a mic coming down from behind you. If you keep your hand up. That's it. Thank you. If these spirits are of a higher order, what's their motivation? Why do they want to have... I always just imagine that the spirits who are influencing us are from a lower position. No, they're not from a lower position in many cases. Firstly, there are spirits in what you would classify to be an intermediate position in the spirit world on the natural love path. So between the second sphere and the fourth or fifth sphere of the spirit world, many of their motivations are that they feel they're doing you a favour or they feel they're doing the earth or people on the earth a favour. Does that make sense? And they feel strongly attached to the favour that they're performing. Um, in their discussion with the, the leaders of the oneness movement this morning, that's one of the big rec feelings they had of, of sadness was how much they believed they were doing a favour when it wasn't actually favourable in the long run to the persons involved. And, and there was a lot of quite deep emotions they had about that. Now, they began uh, a few months ago, the, the, the spirits in the oneness movement, who the leaders of the oneness movement, were in the sixth sphere of the spirit world. They had to go to the third sphere of the spirit world to learn quite a lot of things about the divine love path. And then they are now, they mentioned at the fourth sphere of the spirit world. And that was a very, very difficult place for them to go, to, to realise they go back. And as, as anyone would hear from the uh, channelling that was done, they also had quite a lot of emotions about it, like the male part of the, of the two. Um, he was very, very concerned and sad about the damage that he's done uh, because of the different choices he made when he was in the sixth sphere of the spirit world. And the, the lady involved, she was 
being confronted with a lot of emotions of dominance of the male that she uh, did not deal with, but she was still in the sixth fear. Because you can be in the sixth fear state, in a state where you have intellectually dealt, uh, you think you've intellectually dealt with everything, and yet there are still causal emotions within you that need to be resolved. And this is the problem, is that many of the spirits who are doing it are doing it from quite base emotional conditions that they're ignoring within themselves. And the way they ignore it is the same way many people on the natural love path here on earth ignore it. They go around being this wonderful person who's loving to everybody, but in reality not understanding that there is these deeper emotions driving their condition. And their condition is really a facade in a way, because it's not real. So that's why we can only grow to the sixth fear in, those, in the condition of natural love in that manner. Because beyond that, everything has to get much more real. And, and we talked about that as well, how it's better to have ten people on earth who are unified at the soul level than it is to have ten billion, million people on earth unified in a facade. <laughs> right? And this is the trouble is that a lot of times we, that things are looked at at the facade level, not really understanding what is going on underneath, underneath the play, you know, what's behind the scenes, actually manipulating things and going, what is actually really going on. So today what I would like to do is present to you what is really going on for the majority of these people and for the majority of the people who are um, involved in, you know, and f who are felt to be gurus on the planet. And then what we can do is compare that with what kind of development you have ahead of you. Does that make sense? So what we want to do is look at the difference between real development and development that is only a facade and actually is not as real as it could be. And you will see some very big differences between those forms of development as I illustrate them to you through these examples. So what I first wanted to present to you is what is the underlying, underlying groundwork, the soil or the cultivated area that has to happen inside of yourself to cause a spirit attraction in this manner? In other words, what sets of emotions inside of us can cause an attraction of a spirit that causes a complete overcloaking? Right? Um, yeah, most, all of them are generally addictions. So all of them are generally what you can call bad if you want, but I would call an, addiction, an addictive emotion that needs to be released. So um, if we can use the mic when we make comments too, that would be good. So. Um, maybe an addiction to everything has to be perfect and good. And, and I are interfering with each other there. But. Needing to fix it whenever it isn't the case. So that is very much for me, whatever isn't right. I'm so clever and so whatever. I know how to fix everything, myself and others. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I'd like to do is actually present everyone what the addictions are that cause the trouble. If we could just switch that mic off because it's actually interfering with me. I'll have to change the, the uh, frequencies that I've got set at the moment. Okay, let's have a look at the actual underlying causes. What, what actually causes it? So, everything gets back to our emotional and soul condition, does it not? Right? So let's have a look at how this happens. We've got our mother and our father. So. So there's mum, there's dad. Then we've got ourselves being born or conceived initially. Now our mother and our father have specific emotional injuries and specific emotional bits which are clear of injury. In other words, they have areas that are harmonious with love and truth inside of themselves. As I illustrated yesterday, they have areas also disharmonious with love and truth inside of themselves. So they have both. Now the areas that are harmonious with love and truth create this wonderful protective barrier, if you like, upon the soul. But the areas that are disharmonious with divine truth create these holes in our protective system. So, so for many of us we've got quite a lot of emotions which are holes or areas where spirit influence can easily come in and hook into us. 
Now, the first thing for many parents nowadays in particular is that there's been a series of generations that have slowly released many fears about spirit world and spirit connection. Right? And this generation, of course, is one of the most clearest generations that have released um, their injuries, their emotional injuries, which are their blockages that stop spirit communication. So if both mum and dad are in this state where they've released a lot of their emotional injuries towards spirit interaction, but they still have a lot of other different types of emotional injuries, which they usually do about their childhood and their father and their mother and you know their life and their shames and their guilts and all of those things are still inside of them. Now we've got a set, set up where the emotional injury of the child is very much going to be totally open to spirits but also with the emotional damage of a su that is a su subset, or sorry, a superset, a, com a combination would be the best word, of mum and dad's injuries. So we have a child now who is very open to spirit influence, but also ill-equipped to deal with the influence itself. Does that make sense? We have a child who maybe even can see spirits, right? You know, they talk, they talk to them all the time. You know, they're two years old and they're walking around talking to their friend and mummy asks them, what's going on? And uh, she says, oh, you know, this guy's here and that guy's here. And, and if grandpa passes, hey, grandpa's here, you know, I was just talking to him. And, you know, and as they grow up, obviously, they can verbalise a lot more of this communication that occurs. And they're seeing these spirits all the time, right? So they've got what we classify the gift of mediumship or what you call the gift, gift of seeing in this case or the gift of hearing but in reality all it is because is because the sum total of the parents injuries has allowed them to have this gift and this is why many times the gift of mediumship what seems to be a gift seems to be passed down by family generations so you see groups of families who seem to have a more of a gift in this regard than other families and that's because they have less emotional injuries towards the spirits involved. So this child is now born and it's growing up and it's having all of these spirit interactions. Right? But it's also going to be having spirit interactions and interactions with others based upon its law of attraction of the different emotional holes, if you like, that are in its field or you could say uh, more accurately in the soul. And so this allows areas of influence to channel in. So if you could think of all of these areas as, as areas where information can flow into the child. Does that make sense? So if I draw them as like spirals coming in, as areas of information or energy being able to funnel in, if you like, inwards to the child. Now, there's two types now of emotional injuries which are going to affect the development here. One is if the parents have some quite dark emotions in themselves, obviously the child has automatically absorbed some of these dark emotions. So if they are open to spirits and they have no injuries regarding receiving spirit communication, but at the same time they have quite a dark set of emotions, maybe some anger, rage and those kind of emotions and deeper fears and so forth, the kind of spirits they are going to be attract are not going to be benevolent spirits. Can you see that? They are going to attract a group of spirits who are more malevolent or more, um, have more of an impact upon them in, the sense, in, a, in a negative sense. So let's say dad has this emotion that he's perfectly willing to kill somebody and this historically is definitely the case, perfectly willing to kill somebody if he has to protect his family. Right? And many men still have that emotion, don't they, on the planet? Perfectly willing to kill somebody to protect the family. What that's going to attract for this particular child is obviously also some spirits who are in the same state. Right? And those spirits can influence this child as it's growing up to even believe that it needs protection in some ways. And these spirits, if they are malevolent, can actually influence the child even to justifying a murder for the sake of its family's protection. Right? And because the child is, the emotional injuries of the fa family have been on the child not released, that influence can occur. 
You also have groups of spirits that can surround this child who are malevolent, who want to affect the child. And many of the so-called illnesses that we have today, like schizophrenia, for example, uh, is an illness where groups of spirits are hooking through different, different areas that the child has and influencing them, and eventually they get to the point where the child's hearing multitude of voices of different types, telling them to do things, not do things, even kill people, not kill people, no, to, 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 to get out of society, get into society in a certain way. All these different messages are coming at them, which the medical profession goes, well, this is pretty strange. Let's call this schizophrenia and let's medicate them. Right? But in reality, what it is, is this child is very, very open mediumistically and able to receive all of this communication from the external environment, from the spirit world, and they know, the majority of them, if you talk to almost any schizophrenic I've ever talked to, has always said they know they're talking to real people, even though the medical profession suggests otherwise. Now, that kind of influence then can influence many of the problems that we face on Earth with regard to so-called illnesses, particularly of the mental illness variety. Does that make sense? So Tourette's syndrome, for example, what do you think that might be? Well, it's quite obvious, really. A very mediumistic person being influenced at different times through different emotional connections by spirits who just want to swear occasionally and let off some steam, right? And then you've got the schizophrenic type, type person who has a certain set of emotional conditions. Everything is based on the emotional condition that attracts a certain group of spirits and away that goes in terms of, its, in terms of how that's displayed. You've got manic depression, which only occurs through highs. So the person gets into their high state, which is the heavily spirit-influenced state. They're doing all these different things for all these different spirits. And eventually what happens is the body exhausts itself of the connection. And now they can't connect to the spirits at all. So what happens? They fall into a great big heap emotionally, into a highly depressed state, suicidally depressed state generally. And then their body recovers over a period of time due to the forced rest and recovery that's imposed upon them through the condition. And when the body recovers to a point where the spirits can reconnect to them, what do the spirits do? Reconnect again, and off we go on the same cycle again. Right? These are all people who are very mediumistic. In fact, my feelings on when I meet many of these people are is that they're some of the most mediumistic people on this planet are people with, that other people think have got a terrible illness. Right. unfortunately. Now, that's one group of spirits that are going to be able to influence this child. If this child has a group of emotions that, you know, which is the average, I suppose you could say, group of emotions on the planet. The other type of child is this type of child, where mum and dad don't have as many of those kind of emotional injuries, and also where there is a strong spirit attachment to guides. So let's put some guides in the mix. Where one of the guides can actually finish up influencing the child almost completely. So they go, as I illustrated with Alex, into that overcloaking state. Where now the spirit is displaying through the child the spirit's condition. Now, everyone on earth goes, wow, that's a wonderful child. Isn't this child so unique? Isn't this child amazing? And so forth and so forth. And we talk about the child and how special it is and gifted it is. And in reality, the majority of times, what's actually going on, and when I say majority of times, there hasn't yet been a time where I've noted the opposite, um, where there is a heavy spirit influence going on. Now, if this child is in quite a bright condition in that they have less emotional injuries from their family and their environment, the connection from the spirit can be maintained on almost a permanent basis. Right? And the only time the child gets to rest from that condition is when it's asleep. Because in that state, the spirit doesn't control the body. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? So what happens then is the child almost, and particularly when it's very young, in its day-to-day -day life, is almost totally motivated by the desires of the spirit. Right? And when it goes to sleep, it now rests from that condition, so its body gets the rest and recovery it needs for the spirit to reconnect again the moment the child wakes. 
and off we go again the next day, exactly the same way. Does that make sense? But unfortunately what also generally happens is the child through its life gathers more emotional injuries. And what happens later on in life is vastly different to what happens during its childhood with regard to the spirit influence. And we'll talk about that in a minute. You wanted to ask a question about it? Yes. Is that a... Is that on? Um, when we're shown children three and four years of age that um, can play um, a music instrument like, you know, um, um, Jehos, um, whoever could, <laughs> Boathaven could, that's overcloaking then, obviously. A lot of time, and most of the time, yes, it is. Because... Yeah, yeah, because a lot of these things that are learned instantly like that are actually based upon what the spirit knows. So a lot of what you classify on the planet as gifted people actually have received their gifts from the spirit world through an overcloaking or through some kind of spirit influence. So many of the so-called... And, and to be frank with you, there's nothing wrong with that. That was the next question. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because in the end, anything that results in something beautiful being presented on the earth is fine as long as the person on earth is th aware of what's going on. That's the, that's the proviso. Unfortunately, a lot of the times the person on earth is not aware of what's going on and passes into the spirit world in the state of awareness. Now, that is quite cruel to the person on earth and the spirit doing that um, often has a penalty to pay for that particular treatment of that person. Um, next on that, AJ, there was a case where there was a child who was very gifted like that, but when it became into their teens, lost the gift totally. Yes, so and a lot of times the children will lose the gifts because as their emotional injuries develop, it prevents the connection from being maintained. Does that make sense? So, so by the time they become a teenager, they're now starting to gain their own emotional injuries rather than just the injuries that were from their environment. And as a result of that, their own soul condition decreases in its, in its ability to maintain a connection with the spirit. And if the spirit is of a spirit who's anywhere higher than the second sphere generally, it's very much more difficult usually to maintain the connection. And so therefore generally the spirit and the child parts ways and therefore the gift also disappears at the same time. This is why a lot of these so-called unexplained events about gifts appearing all of a sudden and disappearing all of a sudden are actually very easily explained when you understand the background of what's really going on at the spirit and soul level. Yeah. So if you imagine for a moment this child has now this overcloaked, is overcloaked by this, in this example I'm giving a woman spirit, overcloaked by this woman spirit, and basically the woman spirit is working with the child and doing lots of different very powerful things that everyone around the child thinks is really amazing. Now, can you see straight away, the fact that everyone around thinks it's really amazing actually increases the connection between the child and the spirit, of course, because now the child's now receiving adm admiration and lots of other types of emotions that it may not have ordinarily received. And as a result of those emotions, now the connection becomes more solidified, m much more stronger and easily maintained. The spirit now has less of a trouble maintaining the connection than it had before. Alex, if we can have Mike there. I've just got really intense fears just coming up now. Yep. Um, everything that you've just spoken about, I've experienced my entire life. Yep. Um, I used to see spirits when I was a kid, um, and I sort of shut that down. Went right through my teens, just uh, drug and alcohol binges for days and days. Yep until a total physical shutdown, um, depression come back, this uh, massive highs, massive lows. Um, yeah. whew, um, like the whole lot, um, even before, just before I met you, I was, um, spirits were actually wanting me to be a guru. Yeah. I was on the heavily, like a yoga path and, and through my guru, I was having dreams of, of big control over people, yep. all sorts of stuff. So what was happening is that during, after your teenage years and you went through that part of trying to prevent it all, mm -hmm. after that you went through the spiritual phase yep. where now you started attracting natural love spirits to you mm -hmm. and those spirits were wanting you to teach their teachings on the earth and the yoga style teachings on the earth and, and they were basically 
preparing you by saying you're going to get all of these wonderful things happening to you if you do this and so forth. And can you see how the linkage occurs? It's quite easy if, as a spirit to link into unhealed emotions and then and then actually cause a person to make a decision to do something. I was already like, I was given so much power and energy. Like mm. I was sleeping two, three hours a night and that was plenty. Yep. Like I had ridiculous amounts of energy. Yep. I'd work 12 hours, I'd go out, sleep two hours, go do another 12 hour shift, no yep. problem. Yep. Ridiculous amounts of sexual energy. Yeah. Just unbelievable. Yeah. And they would s set up like, you know, women. Liaisons for in, you as all well. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. 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 So uh, you can see how I easy it is to do it when we have a certain emotional condition based on what's going on with the parents in our life. Yeah. And, and you can see how addictive it can be sometimes too, hey? Oh, yeah. Like, you know, if a man's not had this in endless sequence of women and all of a sudden he's getting an endless sequence of women coming to him wanting to have sex with him, then that can be quite addictive if you're not careful, couldn't it? Like all of a sudden lots of women want you. Why is that? Like, you, you don't think about why is that. You just think, oh, it must be pretty good. Like, so, <laughs> and, and you don't go much further than that oftentimes. And, and then when you have these dreams of like the grandeur things, that, the grandiose things that we can accomplish, not realising that many of those dreams come from spirits who have very unaccomplished lives on, of their own on earth and they're trying to now have an accomplished life through you, then of course we can easily get addicted to that emotionally. The key is to not be afraid of it so much though, Alex. The key is to understand what's actually going on and how you can change all of that now that you know what's going on. Because actually your mediumistic gift can be used for great benefit as well as great harm to yourself. And it really, in the end, does come down to a choice going on within yourself as to which way you will choose. And what I've been trying to encourage people to do is to they, many of you have really good mediumistic gifts, right? And what I've been trying to encourage you to do is to work through the emotions as to why you want to get glory or why you want to get power or why you want to get control from them. Work through those emotions and let's start having loving emotions about using the gift because there's so many very powerful loving things that you can do with the gift of mediumship. So it's not something to be afraid of the gift but it is something to be aware of what's going on and what's going on emotionally and how everything is affecting me. And that's why I wanted to raise the discussion today. But just with the fear that I'm feeling at the moment, yep. that this would it be good to get, get into that though? Well, some of the fear, unfortunately, is the spirits themselves. Can you imagine what they're going to feel? Like I'm telling somebody a truth about their relationship with a spirit. What is the person going to do with that information, most probably? they're going to be quite a bit more careful with their relationship with the spirits, right? And if they do that, then how does the spirit, what's the spirit going to feel about that? Well, the spirit's going to be afraid that they're not going to be able to connect through you anymore, that they're not going to be able to get what they wanted out of life anymore, that they're not going to be able to influence you to do this or do that or have the women or have the power or, you know, all the things that they are personally addicted to. And so, of course, there's going to be some fear associated with the spirit themselves about the possible possibility of a disconnection between yourself and them. And so many of them will heavily resist that. When we spoke today to the group of uh, the, the oneness blessing uh, people, I had an opportunity two and a half years ago of speaking to the same group of spirits and the two spirits we spoke to today refused that opportunity because they knew what I was going to say to them and they didn't like the outcome or consequences of that at the time. Does that make sense? And said what they wanted to do is just ignore that and, and it took them that period of time and, and what happened was some of their deep and closest friends became, got, got onto the divine love path in the spirit world and eventually that influenced them to re-look at what was going on. The truth is for the spirits connected to you, they have nothing to fear. They only have really beautiful things to look forward to when they live their own life but they don't know that yet. And because they don't know that or believe that yet, they have a feeling that of fear, if you, d you know, separate from them, what are they going to do with their life? And that is a deep fear that many spirits do have, particularly spirits be in, in between the second and the fifth spheres of the spirit world. Yep. So this is where it's important for you to recognise what emotion is yours and one of your emotions is based around fear of, am I going to be a powerful person if this person leaves me? Am I going to have it, like before I felt like I knew a lot of things, am I still going to know those things when they leave me? 
You know what I mean? So there's some fears from the person on earth there, but there's also some fears from the spirit influencing those fears. And they, so it's basically saying, please don't change, please don't change, please don't change. And I'm feeling like, I don't want to change, I don't want to change. And they're feeling like they don't want to change and that doubles my feeling that I don't want to change. And then there's a lot more resistance to actually changing the bond between myself and that spirit into a more loving bond. So we don't ever want to reject our spirit friends because they are just as good as any other friend that we've got. But we want our bond to be a loving one not one based upon things that we don't know or don't, are not aware of. We want it to be based on love instead. Yeah. Yeah. We have the mic back there. Yeah, AJ, when I was really little, I used to have night terrors. Yep. And my son also, he used to have them really badly. Mm -hmm. um, is that what's going on there? Yeah, pretty much all night terrors that occur. Um, there's two types of night terrors that occur. The one type is when the child is just about to go to sleep or just about to wake up. During that time is the time when you are coming back basically from wherever you are in the spirit world. Your soul and your spirit body is coming back. It traces back down the silver cord, which is the connection between your body and your soul, your spirit body and your soul and your physical body. And it traces it back and then it re-enters your physical body. Now many children experience that as a feeling and many of you probably can even remember that feeling sometimes during your childhood and even your adult life, right? Now, as that occurs, that is the most sensitive time for you to be aware of spirits and have a recollection of it. And because of that space, usually the leaving of the body time or the, or the return of the body, that's usually the time that we see or are surrounded by spirits that we can see. And some of those spirits will obviously be very, the spirits and how they look, will be very dependent upon the condition of my parents as to what I'm attracting. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, my son, he, um, I could never cope with it. When he would have them, I would just, oh, and my husband would have to get up. Yep. And he would just be saying, get them away from me, get them away from me. Yep. In absolute terror. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Now, he probably hasn't experiencing those spirits on a permanent basis in the spirit world in the sense that his condition would be brighter than their condition in the spirit world. But it's as he comes back to his body, these spirits are able to observe the process and observe the process of leaving. And that becomes very scary for a child unless it knows what is going on. We talked about fear a lot today in our channeling. And one of the things that the spirits who we talked to learnt about fear is that fear isn't real, actually. And this is something to explain to your children. That even, though the, even though these spirits look ugly and look demonistic and like they can harm you, and many of them will project a feeling, at, you know, anger or rage at you, they can't actually hurt you. And it's only your, your emotional belief that they can that causes your distress. Does that make sense? And if we can help our child through that emotional belief, which is actually you dealing with your emotional belief, right, then that can actually be released and he wouldn't have that fear about going to sleep or waking up. That's a different kind of experience than what one lady yesterday ex experienced, and that was during her sleep state, negative things that she remembered happening. That is things that are actually happening in the spirit world, and that is happening because of different emotions that we're holding on to at the time. So, so if you remember being raped, for example, in the spirit world, or you remember some negative events like that in the spirit world, that's because there are some emotions inside of you that have attracted that event in the spirit world that need to be addressed. And, and once you have the courage to address them and the willingness, all of those experiences will stop until you finish the dealing of those particular experiences. Yeah. If we go straight behind you to Anna. It's on still, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, do you know what it is when you're falling asleep? Like... Sometimes Where you feel like you're falling. Uh, yeah. Yep. That's, the, that's the feeling of leaving your body. Right? So many of you have that, right? Yeah. On almost constant basis. <laughs> right? and, and you know how you wait with the start sometimes. You're just about falling asleep and, and then you come away. That's the thing of coming back to your body in a shock because you're a bit afraid about the leaving process. Now many of us are afraid about the leaving process because of the spirits that surround us at the time of leaving. So, so when I'm leaving at the moment, I can feel like hundreds and thousands of very nasty spirits around me just projecting rage at me. So it's a bit hard to go through that and leave and, and then return through that. And you have a feeling about that. Some of you wake up with dread. 
one of the reasons why is because of this. Uh, it's because there's actually a group of spirits around you who you are afraid of dealing with and you are afraid and you need to deal with that fear. Does that make sense? Thank so you. That's what those feelings are. If we go straight across. AJ, my daughter started having night terrors when she was four. Yeah. Um, and it was about half an hour after she went to sleep, but particularly on the days that she was overtired. And she wouldn't wake up. She was in a state where, you know, we couldn't, we'd go into it and she didn't know we were there and she would scream and yell, but her body would be thrusting. And... Um, what, what happened when you were four? I don't remember. Mm. <laughs> but one of the things that would happen when she woke up the next morning. This Did is you feel that feeling morning. that you just had when I said what happened when you were four? The dread. <laughs> yes. That's why you don't remember. Yeah. Because you are afraid of what happened when you were four with spirits. But please continue. Um, her, around her, anus is always bruised. Yes. And um, so I would go into what's happening to her and I couldn't help. It was my helplessness of not being able to help her and not knowing what was going on. Yeah. Um, but obviously it's all mine, isn't it? Well, it's not just yours. You've got to look at the fact that she's obviously attracting something. So, so um, if is, is her anus physically bruised, then I'd be looking at something happening in the physical because a spirit wouldn't physically bruise somebody's anus. Does that make sense? So there's something going on in the physical that you need to address there. But you also need to look at, this, of, at the things that happened when you were four. Like let yourself, the way to get into him is quite simple. When I, I said, what happened to you when you were four, your instant response was terror, right? Now what you, the way to get into the emotion is quite simple. All you need to do is feel that terror. Feel the terror you feel about it. And as you feel the terror, an awareness will come to you of what went on for you. Does that make sense? Now a lot of times our children's bodies reflect the soul, con our soul condition as parents of what we're denying. So I've seen children, for example, who their mothers have said have, have bruised vaginas, for example, and nothing's happened to the child, but the mother has gone through a, a, abuse that she's never dealt with emotionally. And it's now coming out in the body of the child. I've seen, I've seen children go into, like young children, go into big rashes all over their body. Right? And a lot of the time it's the mother or father's fear, emotion, fear type emotions and anger type emotions that the mother and father are not dealing with and are so heavily suppressing. So, so don't discount the physical that might be occurring but have also, you need to have a strong look at, again the law of attraction with regard to the child is always relating to the parent in some way. And that's why I asked you the question of what happened to you when you were four. Usually things happen with children onset at certain ages because they onset at certain ages in our own childhood that we now have shut down. So I've seen children, for example, I've given this example before I think, where a child, a male child, has been fine with his mother up until he's four years of age and then from then on he's screaming at his mother. Now something happened in mum's life at four years of age for this child now to be feeling so much anger towards her from that time on. And as soon as, often what happens in terms of soul psychology, if you like, a lot of what happens is when our child reaches the age that we were affected by something in our own childhood that's not healed, our child will begin to exhibit the same kind of problems and conditions that we are actually denying within ourselves about that age. And all we need to do is do what you just started doing and that is just go into that terror feeling and you'll start owning it and see the difference in your child. Now if your child's having issues with going to sleep or staying asleep because of terror, then that is definitely the parent's issue. Does that make sense? Always. It's not happening anymore to her? What yep. does that mean? Well that's a good sign. It means you might have dealt with something about it, about the terror. But I suggest to you the fact that I just stated something about four years of age and you went into terror means there's more there to deal with. I think the terror is that I don't know anything about it and then that, you know, it's fear of the fear. Fear, fear of the unknown. Yeah. Right? Fear of what actually happened, yeah. yeah. To, to be frank, many of us have heavily denied our childhoods to such an extent that we can't even remember them. And there's got to be a very good emotional reason why you've done that, right? And what we will do in the end is we'll get to the point where we will remember most of our childhood quite clearly 
And, and that is only by lifting the emotional veils off of each memory. Because each memory has its own emotional attachment. And therefore, as you release, release the emotional veil off the memory, so therefore the memory comes and appears back to you. I want to continue, sorry, I'm, I'm going to continue a little bit because there's more groundwork to be done here that may answer many of your questions. So let's continue with this discussion for a bit longer and then we can maybe ask some more questions. Now, in this, you can see this child, this child is heavily influenced by the parent's emotional condition really at this point. And so therefore the child is actually, when it's being influenced by spirits, it's really the parent's emotional condition that either affords the protection or lack of such to the child. Right? So, so if that's the case, this child can go in one of two ways. It can be influenced quite negatively by darker spirits who try to control it and attempt to control it and the child goes through lots of fear-based type experiences. What do we do as parents generally under those conditions? Well, what most parents would do is they'd start trying to shut those experiences down, wouldn't they? because those experiences seem very damaging to told. As a parent, you feel quite powerless, feel quite distressed, and you don't know really what's happening. And so what you try to do is dampen down the child, nurse the child through the distress that it's feeling, and eventually the child learns to disconnect from the spirit influence. And many times, from the time they're five, six years, seven years of age, they've almost fully disconnected from spirit influence in the sense of not influence, but in the sense of overcloaking type influence or negative very damaging, malevolent spirit influence. And that only reoccurs when their own soul condition starts generating its own law of attraction events and oftentimes re-attracts re spirits. And so this is why many during their teenage years might have had experience when they were very much younger to do with spirits. And then during their teenage years they might have taken up drinking or smoking pot or whatever. And before you know it, by the time they're 20, 25, they're starting to go into maybe schizophrenia or some kind of so-called illness like that. And the reason why that occurs is they had a period of time in their life, in the beginning, where they, were quite, they, they had a quite open spirit influence. They then shut it down during a, during a period of life. But then in the process of alcohol or drugs or some other type of influence, that opens up, again, the connection process and opens up the potentiality for connection to spirits. And so then the spirits come in and influence the child and before they know it they're heavily influenced by the time they're in their 20s or 30s. And this is why a lot of schizophrenia seems to come around f during that time period and also why a lot of it seems to be manipulated by the fact that the person did take drugs or, or ha had a lot of alcohol and things like that. So what's going on for many is this, is this cycle, if you like, through their life of being a possessed, if you like, by spirits, by, by a spirit fully almost overcloaking the person and guiding the majority of their actions. And then the person becomes afraid of those actions or gets punished for those actions or you know, society looks down upon them for the actions so the person distances themselves from the spirit that causes a disconnection and now the, the person seems to be normal again, seems to be okay again and then later in their life a similar event occurs again oftentimes. And this is why when somebody is said to have schizophrenia for example that they also said to be never be able to be fully cured. Right? And this is because there is this underlying condition that's going to reoccur through their entire life. Now that is all well and good with regard to uh, spirit, spirits who are malevolent. Now what I would like to do is look with you at the spirits who are benevolent, who are a lot better than that, who have a lot more happier emotions and beautiful emotions that they want to give the human race and that they have a lot more love in themselves and what they do with that but they still have a belief they can overcloak people. So they, they choose to overcloak people. And usually, as I've said, they choose to overcloak people in order to illustrate some kind of truths that they personally have learnt that they feel the human race needs to learn. And so in their mind, they have, an ulti they have an ulterior motive, but their motive is ultimately good, is how they feel about that. They feel that they are perfectly justified in actually having that experience. So what they do, so we just take the parents out of the circumstances now. We know where all the emotions have come from. 
What the spirits do is they look around for a person who is very, very mediumistic and who has some very basic qualities of love and truth and an understanding of humanity and all of those kind of qualities which often parents nowadays do have, who are mediumistic. And so what they do is they look around for such a person and then they, from a very young age, and sometimes, by the way, in the womb, they do this, they connect to the child from an emotional perspective. So they begin their projection of emotions and feelings and everything at the child. Now this child might be born and it might be, say, three years old, let's say, and all of a sudden the person as an adult remembers this three-year-old experience where they believed they were at one with the universe. They had this feeling they were at one with everything and one with the universe. They had this knowing, what they call a knowing occur within them, that all of a sudden this amazing experience. And then they go around after that spouting all of this wisdom. Like I've heard this coming out of three-year-old children, a lot of wisdom that I know is actually not the wisdom of the three-year-old child, but rather a wisdom of the spirit that is projecting through the child all this wisdom. Now, now, of course, the child in this state is going to receive a lot of adoration from the adults around it, is it not? So you've got all of the adults around it, including mum and dad generally, uh, projecting also all of these different feelings of adoration towards the child. So you've got the spirits feeling very, admir uh, you know, lots of adoration for the child and you've got the parents and others in the environment feeling that. That just heightens the connection. It establishes the connection even further and much more strongly than it was before. Now, obviously, as this child grows, it has different emotional experiences. But none of those emotional experiences are, are generally being allowed to be experienced by the spirit who's overcloaking it. Do you follow me? The spirit is having all of this, the spirit's got all this wonderful, if you've got an overcloaking spirit over the top of you, imagine for a moment, that you've got this happening, and the spirit over the top of you is in, say, a six-sphere condition. So in other words, they're in love with every person in the universe. That they love every person in the universe. They have some very specific viewpoints in their mind about what metaphysical truth is. They have some very specific viewpoints about what God is and about what religion should be and about what humanity should be and so forth. And m most of those things are harmonious with natural love, even though they may not be the truth, that is divine truth, they'll be harmonious with natural love. In other words, there's a feeling of love coming out of them towards everyone around them. Now, obviously, for the child, that's going to feel wonderful. And then, let's say, in one place, they have a bully experience at school due to the child's other law of attraction of what's going on in their soul. Now, obviously, the bully experience at school is going to be very different for that child that's overcloaked by that spirit than it is for the average child because the spirit is actually handling the event for the child. But it's an event that the child will have an emotion about and it also has an underlying law of attraction. Otherwise, it wouldn't have occurred. Do you follow me? And so what's going on now is the spirit who's overcloaking the child is now affecting how the child emotionally processes through the events of its life. Do you follow me? Then the spirit thinks it's doing the child a lot of favours. It's preventing the child from feeling lots of different negative emotions and experiences. Right? Not realising that actually the child has already in it, due to the emotional injuries coming from its own parents, that soul condition that's never being addressed through the law of attraction. See, normally, the law of attraction would come and the child would be confronted with the emotion. The emotion would be released at the causal level and now the child doesn't have that emotion in it. That would be the normal experience. But since this spirit is now overcloaking this child, what happens is the child doesn't have that normal experience of releasing its causal emotion about the event that attracted the event in the first place. Right? And instead, what the child experiences is this beautiful feeling coming and management feeling coming from the spirit who is actually managing the situation. So you can imagine that occurring. So the child might, over a period of 40 years, get 30 or 40 different people trying to bully it because that emotion is still within side of its soul. But 
the spirit manages every one of those events. Right? So what is the spirit really doing? It's preventing the child from releasing a causal emotion. That could be to its long-term benefit and that could actually mean that it never gets bullied again. Right? That's what's actually happening. The spirit doesn't aware, isn't aware of that happening because many of these spirits that are doing the overcloaking are not aware of how the law of attraction works at the soul level. So they're not aware that they're actually creating this, this sequence of events. And many times when they become aware of it, they're totally amazed at their own, at their own, let alone the child's, but at their own ability to be able to overcloak this child for so long and harm the child for so long. Does that make sense? So. So what's happening uh, oftentimes through the child's life is it has these opportunities through this law of attraction to deal with a whole group of emotions, but the spirit who is with the child prevents the child from experiencing those causal emotions. By the way, I just want to make a comment. Many who have left our discussion so far have more spirit influence than the rest of you because many of the spirits who are with them are very confronted by the information that I'm talking about. Right? So that's just something to bear in mind. All right. Let's what, look what happens when this child grows up. This child grows up. This child has now received large groups of emotions from a large number of people by this stage generally about how amazing it is and how amazing its connection with God is. It, it's like the Christ child and all of these different things are being said about this child, right? And this child now is an adult. So it's no longer three years old, but now she's a grown woman. And by this stage, the desires of the spirit are paramount. The child barely even recognises its own desires anymore. And unless the child does things or the person does things that are negative, that will degrade its own moral condition, the, main, the, the spirit connection will be able to be maintained till the moment of their death. And, or until the moment that their, spirit, their physical body degrades so much that, uh, that a disconnection has to occur. It takes uh, about four seconds to warm up when you turn it on. Hello. What level sphere of spirits are we talking about here? Like when you uh, say benevolent... If they're benevolent, there'll be any sphere, sphere from the second to the sixth who will do this. If we come down the front. Uh. I'm really scared right now. Yeah. <laughs> but I just wanted to um, clarify something that you said before. Yep. <laughs> if, um, <laughs> if I'm like uh, having a dream. Yeah. And, like, for example, my mum's in the, that dream, does that mean that her spirit's there at the time? Not necessarily, right? There, there are two types of dreams, and one type of dream is a dream that you have purposely to trigger an emotion in you, and the other type of dream is a dream about what happened in the sleep state, so an actual event. So the, in both cases, the best thing to do is feel about the emotion that it generates in every case. But... but just because you have a dream, it does not mean that that dream is reality. Does so, that um, there, this morning I actually had a dream <laughs> that my boyfriend was strangling me. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if his spirit would have been doing that in the spirit dream. Um, I, the best thing I can say to you is not necessarily. I won't, I'm not going to give you the definitive <laughs> answer because you need to feel emotionally about that dream. Yeah. And the, what it was the emotion you felt when you woke up? Well, I, um, I actually took myself out of that place when I was dreaming and I'm like, I, I feel this is a dream, this isn't real. So yeah, no, don't, don't bother doing that. All <laughs> of you who do that with your terrifying dreams, stop doing that because <laughs> terrifying <laughs> dreams are a law of attraction event. Yeah. Yeah, so. um, and my second thing... Yeah. Ever since a young age, <laughs> I've been, every time I go to sleep, I actually clench my jaw and grind my, my teeth. Yeah, yeah. And I've, the um, dentist found out when I was about 10 or 12 or something. Yeah. 
So I've been having to wear this huge mouth guard. Yep, I've had to do the same. Okay. Yep, so I, I was just wondering about. what that was about. Yep. Um, again, that is, a, that is a feeling of fear and dread that is driving you. So when you go through the sleep state and when you enter in the sleep state coming out of it, you've obviously got a lot of fear and dread that is inside of you and you're feeling some of it right now, which is yeah. really good. And this fear, it's very important for you to process this fear just like you're doing right now, by crying, letting your body shake. That's the way to process your way through it. Um, a lot of people shut that down because it looks a bit strange. Yeah, I'm very um, embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it looks a bit strange and everybody starts to worry about you and everybody thinks, oh, we better take care of the doctor or whatever. <laughs> when in reality, all you need to do is just allow your body to release this. As your body releases this, all of the muscles also release. And as your emotion releases, you'll find that the jaw will also start releasing. And when the jaw releases, you won't have to do the TMJ stuff anymore. You'll be able to not have the, uh, the big, chunky, guard, the big chunky sexy guard, in, mouth guard. Yeah, yeah, inside of your mouth. And you'll be able to sleep without grinding your teeth. If you're grinding your teeth when you're asleep, it's due to terror and fear. Okay. Now, mum needs to look at her stuff here too, right? So there's terror and fear still inside of your mum that you need to address and that you need to allow yourself to experience in the same manner that you're letting yourself experience it right now by shaking and crying. And that pretty much answers my um, other question because when I'm in large groups of people, sometimes it's not as bad as it used to be, but um, I suffer slight anxiety attacks yep, and yep. loss of breath. Yep. Is that spirit influenced? Well, or? No, well, no, firstly it begins with your own fear. So even if it is spirit influenced, so a lot of anxiety attacks are certainly spirit influenced, but it begins with your own fear. So the more you can do what you're doing right now, right? So what I did, I had lots of this to deal with and what I had to do was I laid on my bed and I just laid myself to cry and shake and cry and shake and cry and shake and sometimes I used to do it for three hours a day for a while, right? Until it was all gone. Does that make sense? Okay. And once it all goes, you won't have the jaws problem anymore and you won't have the body issues anymore and you won't feel a dread when you leave and enter your body anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, it all can be dealt with and you need to remember that God's there just always <laughs> protecting you if you ask for that help and they have a willingness to deal with the terror. Yesterday I said to the group that as long as we have a willingness that protects us from other influences that can be negative. So the trouble with terror for most of us is we're unwilling to experience it like you're experiencing it now. So this is very good. You need to allow yourself to experience it like you're experiencing it now and that demonstrates that willingness and during that time is when you receive the most protection and you'll find you'll get through it. It took me around three months or so of this uh, before it went away for me. I had lots of terror to deal with and I don't feel you have as much as what I've had to deal with. But uh, I basically had terror um, thing, attacks every day for three months uh, for quite a few hours at a time. And, and, and once they were all gone, it went down to five minutes and after a while it just went away completely and I don't have them anymore at all. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you need to release this terror because the terror will attract terrifying events and it attracts terrifying dreams and attacks all sorts of, attracts all sorts of things. It's good to release it. Once you've released it, none of those things occur. Yeah. <laughs> And, and a lot of this is mum's, unfortunately. So mum needs to also <laughs> do some of this work, right? She needs to do the same with her terror. And some of her terror comes from her parents and, their, and the childhood and, and the things that happened during the war. And I, I do feel, I mean, I, I have been working on it and my terror has decreased yep. to, a, to a degree. To a degree, yep. And I'm hoping that even that I've done that is somehow, even though it doesn't look like it, it's sort of helping No, no, it her. is helping because just your willingness to deal with your terror opens it up for your, for your children to actually feel this emotion without you judging it. See, a lot yeah. of parents would look at their child shaking like this and they'd go into terror themselves. Oh, what, what's going on? I've got to stop this, you know, and got to get her medicated or whatever. And the reality is all it is is the expression of an emotion that needs to be released. And once it's released, it will be gone for good. So I've had the jaw thing where I had that for three years. I used to sleep with a jaw thing in and, and it did nothing, of course, for me at all. And, uh, and I wore away a lot of my molars right at the back because of it. I had all of these problems through here. I've got flat front teeth, if you notice as well. And, and I had all of, this, all of the jaw problems through all of my jaw through here. So much so that my jaw would dislocate all the time in the morning. So, so I'd wake up with a dislocated jaw and have to pop it back in, which was quite painful, obviously. 
and that's why I finished up having the, the guard. But, but it was all driven by fear and, and every time it happened I just had to remind myself that no, this is just fear and I need to work my way through it. When I actually had a willingness inside of myself to work through the fear, at that point everything started changing very rapidly. And so you obviously have a willingness to deal with your fear, otherwise you wouldn't be allowing your fear to be present. It's been holding me back throughout my whole life, so of course. I really do want to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. And it's great to release it. You'll feel to so different. You won't even recognise yourself. <laughs> You'll feel so different. Um, and, and fear is a lovely thing to get rid of, because once you get rid of it... If you haven't listened to, actually, if we do put the channelling on the net today, if we have the listen, there's a group of Israelite spirits who came to talk with me today who had been tortured and abused by, by some slaves, uh, owners, slave owners, and, uh, in, in Egypt. And, uh, and they were in a place of abject terror. And that, listening to that may connect you with some of the terror that they were feeling as well. And it might just help you work your way through that emotionally. Yeah. Can I just continue though? Because I need to say a few more things and then I can answer a lot of these questions. Now, the reason why I want to continue is because there's a lot more to tell you <laughs> before we get uh, down to the nitty-gritties of the questions uh, that you want to ask. Now, the perception of this adult person is that this adult person is enlightened. That's the perception. And that this adult person has all of this awareness that nobody else seems to have. That's the perception. That, the, that this person emanates love. I've heard one person say, love just came out of his eyes, like, to me, right? I heard another person say, um, she, she can't believe, uh, she said to me, I can't believe, you're not Jesus, she said to me. Um, and I said, oh, yeah, no worries, I'm okay with that. And she said, well, um, the reason why is when, when I look at you, there's not this love that comes towards me. Hmm. I find that quite interesting and we'll talk about that. <laughs> what actually the reason why was but the man who was projecting, this guru that was projecting this love at her, was actually projecting at her through her addiction. And of course I refuse to engage with somebody's addiction, which a person feels as a rejection. So they don't feel that I love them. Does that make sense? Whereas this, this woman felt this other man she'd met loved her and had this beautiful overwhelming sensation of love coming towards her and in reality she was just addicted to a man projecting sexual love feelings at her so which I wasn't going to give her so what often happens is that this spirit can know this spirit now remember there's now a spirit let's make it a female spirit in this case shall we the spirit is now heavily overcloaking the individual so the spirit is basically acting out all its desires of what it wants to accomplish on earth basically now, when I come along to interact with this person, who, who am I getting? A lot of the times I'm getting the spirit, aren't I? Not the person. Can you see that? I'm getting a combination, really, if you like, of the two people. And, and I am going to make a judgment of the person based on what I see right in front of me rather than really what's going on, because for the majority of us, we can't see this influence affecting that person. Can you see that? And so I then start to really have a deep admiration for this person. This person's amazing. I can learn so many things. This is how the guru syndrome begins. Does that make sense? What happens is I'm just amazed and blown away by all this stuff coming from the person, and not so much from the stuff coming from the person, but their own condition seems to be so peaceful and calm and tranquil and beautiful. And I'm just overwhelmed not so much by the truth coming out of their mouth. And in fact, if I listen to the truth coming out of mouth, I might actually find that there might not be as much truth as I thought. But a lot of the times I'm just overwhelmed by the feelings coming from them. And, the fe like, and I'm so attracted to the feelings coming from the person. Now, this spirit knows why my emotional condition. You know how they know it? They just have a look at my spirit body, scan my spirit body, there it is, there's this colour, there's that colour, there's this colour, that means this, that, that. They have a look at my memories, oh yes, I see he was abused when he was three, this happened, that happened. And straight away they can choose to do what they want with that information through the person they're connected to. Does that make sense? So 
let's say if the, if the spirit is not quite as developed yet as they could be. Right? They might notice my condition and they might feel this person here is like hasn't got a partner. And they might feel, oh, he's quite a nice person to choose for a partner for this person. So what they do is they give her all of these lovely emotions of this is my soulmate, this is the one I'm meant to be with the rest of my life, right? And they give me the same kind of emotions, which of course I'm very open to because I have that um, admiration of the person in the first place. And before we know it, we think we're in a soulmate relationship and may even stay in that relationship for the rest of our life as a result of that one thing that the spirit knew about me. Right? And, and can easily manipulate the events. Now, the spirit may have just thought that they've also done both myself and the person who's being overcloaked a favour. And of course that's what they, in the majority of cases, do feel. They have done a favour. And yet in reality, that person may not be my soulmate at all. But I've got these wonderful feelings of love coming out of me towards them. There's wonderful feelings of love coming towards me. There's this wonderful sexual interaction that's going on between the both of us because of what's going on emotionally. And all of it is actually being influenced by someone else other than the two of us. Right? Now, if the spirit is a bit higher than that in its development, it perhaps would not do that. But it might instead do something like this. Here I am, the person coming along to speak with the person, and it, this spirit knows that actually in the future I might be a very powerful teacher because I've got certain attributes and qualities that give me the ability to teach others quite well. In other words, a lot of might, might be might be a dynamic speaker. I might have certain qualities and attributes within myself, and a good vocabulary and and a much better diction than what AJ has, and you and and in the end be a really really good like teacher that could be used to teach a certain truth. Now if this, this spirit has the truth inside of them that the Hindu way is the way, right? and they've not given up that belief system yet because they still feel in the spirit world that there's all these Hindu beliefs that are very accurate and of course there are some that are very accurate. So they have some truths there and they can see that I'm going to be a spiritual teacher and all they need to do is actually help me see that the Hindu way is the truth. Then all they need to do is through this personal interaction with me and the person that I admire, they can easily get me to change my entire life to become the teacher they expected. Right? Really easily, can't they? So it, my desire to teach leads me to a person who I admire and, and I admire this, I want to teach that. Right? And then the spirit thinks, he's a good teacher, we can work with this and away we go. We've now got a collaboration, if you like, of emotions that now result in this person, me, the person in this interaction, being heavily influenced by my relationship with the person I admire more, which is the type guru type person, and that then causes me to go into this state where I'm willing to teach what the spirit is actually guiding the person to do. Thinking that it's actually this enlightened person that I'm dealing with. And it's not. It's actually the spirit. So can you see how there can be literally thousands and thousands and thousands of different scenarios that can result from this type of overcloaking. And what I want to do before we, before we start with the questions is actually read one of them to you, an actual physical experience, an autobiographic experience of David Hawkins. Um, who, you've all heard of David Hawkins? He's, uh, he's, wrote, he's written this book, Transcending the Levels of Consciousness. He also created the consciousness scales, if you like, you know, the, what are they, the scale of consciousness from zero... Power versus force, yeah, it was another book that he wrote. And, and he, um, you know, described how the person who's at the level of consciousness of a thousand is like Buddha, Jesus and all those kind of ones, he's saying. And then the ones in the lower levels, and he describes all of them, in fact, many of these scales of consciousness in the book itself. But what is very interesting is his own personal autobiographical experience. That's the interesting thing. So let's 
Let's read some of his autobiographical experience. While the truths reported in this book were scientifically derived and objectively organised, like all truths, they were first experienced personally. A lifelong sequence of intense states of awareness, beginning at a young age, first inspired, and then gave direction to the process of subjective realisation that has finally taken the form of this book. At age three, there occurred a sudden full consciousness of existence. A non-verbal but complete understanding of the meaning of I am, followed immediately by the frightening realisation that I, that I might not have come into existence at all. This was an instant awakening from oblivion into a conscious awareness. And in that moment, the personal self was born and the duality of is and is not entered my subjective awareness. When was the consciousness of self actually born? It was when he first incarnated, all right? So when he first incarnated, the consciousness of self began. But he's saying here that the consciousness of self began when he was three. So what was happening here? We have a spirit that caused him to have a metaphysical connection that all of a sudden, all of these awarenesses that he couldn't verbalise at the time due to his age, just came to him. This is a very good sign of a spirit overcloaking. Do you follow me? This kind of example. Throughout childhood and early adolescence, the paradox of existence and the question of reality of self remained a repeated concern. The personal self would sometimes begin slipping back into a greater impersonal self. And the initial fear of non-existence, the fundamental fear of nothingness, would recur. So, what have we got happening now? Throughout his growing years, we have him flicking back into this conscious awareness state and then back into his standard condition. And then back into an awareness state again and back into the standard condition. Can you see what's happening? An establishment of a relationship between himself and a spirit is actually occurring. In 1939, as a paper boy with a 17-mile bicycle route in Wisconsin, on a dark winter's night, I was caught miles from home in a 20 below zero blizzard. The bicycle fell over on the ice and fierce wind ripped the newspapers out of the handlebar basket, blowing them across the ice-covered snowy field. There were tears of frustration and exhaustion and my clothes were frozen stiff. To get out of the wind, I broke through the icy crust of a snowbank, dug out a space and crawled into it. Soon the shivering stopped and there was a delicious warmth, then a state of peace beyond all description. This was accompanied by a suffusion of light and a presence of infinite love that had no beginning and no end and was undifferentiated from my own existence. What happened? When we're in states where we're in a terrified place, we often do attempt to go into out-of-body states in order to cope with the experience. And particularly as children, we do this all the time. What's happening, though, is now, because of this state, this spirit who is, has been with him ever since he can remember from the age of three, now is in a position where he can more, much more greatly influence the person. And in fact can overcloak him to such an extent and protect him from the, both the elements but also any of his localised feelings. In other words, all any of the feelings of his body. And, and instead the spirit gives him those feelings. After that timelessness, there was suddenly an awareness of someone shaking my knee, then my father's anxious face appeared. There was great reluctance to return to the body and all that that entailed but because of my father's love and anguish, the spirit nurtured and reactivated the body. There was a compassion for his fear of death, although at the same time the concept of death seemed absurd. This subjective experience was not discussed with anyone since there was no context available from which to describe it. 
It was, not com it was not common to hear of spiritual experiences other than those reported in the lives of the saints. But after this experience, the accepted reality of the world began to only seem provisional. Traditional religious teachings lost significance and paradoxically, I became an agnostic. Compared to the light of divinity that had illuminated all existence, the God of traditional religion shone dully indeed. Thus, spirituality replaced religion. During World War II, hazardous duty on a minesweeper often brought close brushes with death, but there was no fear in it. It was as though death had lost its authenticity. After the war, fascinated by the complexities of the mind and wanting to study psychiatry, I worked my way through medical school. My training psychoanalyst, a professor at Columbia University, was also an agnostic, and we both took a dim view of religion. The analysis went well, as did my career, and success followed. I did not, however, settle quickly into professional life. I fell ill with a progressive, fatal illness that did not respond to any treatments available. By age 38, I was in extremis, and I knew I was about to die. I didn't care about the body, but my spirit was in a state of extreme anguish and despair. As the final moment approached, the thought flashed through my mind, what if there is a God? So I called out in prayer, if there is a God, I ask him to help me now. I surrendered to whatever God there might be and went into oblivion. When I awoke, a transformation of such enormity had taken place that I was struck dumb with awe. The person I had been no longer existed. There was no personal self or ego, only an infinite presence of such unlimited power that all was all that was. The presence had replaced what had been me and the body and its actions were controlled solely by the infinite will of the presence. The world was illuminated by the clarity of an infinite oneness that expressed itself as all things revealed in their infinite beauty and perfection. Now that sounds pretty nice, doesn't it, being in that state? You can see how you would be fairly much instantly addicted to that state. Can you see that? And of course want to maintain that state. Um, as life went on, this stillness persisted. There was no personal will. Now, this is a major thing to remember. There is no personal will. When there's no personal will, we've got a problem. Right? There's no personal will. The physical body went about its business under the direction of the infinitely powerful but exquisitely gentle will of presence. In that state, there was no need to think about anything. All truth was self-evident and no conceptualization was necessary or even possible. At that time, the nervo ner physical nervous system felt extremely overtaxed, as though it were carrying far more energy than its circuits had been designed for. <laughs> of course it is. Like, <laughs> there's a spirit that is just overtaxing the system. It was not possible to function effectively in the world. All ordinary motivations had disappeared along with all fear and anxiety. There was nothing to seek as all was perfect. Fame, success and money were meaningless. Friends urged the pragmatic return to clinical practice but there was no ordinary motivation to do so. There was now the ability to perceive the reality that underlay personalities. The origin of emotional sickness lay in people's belief that they were per their personalities. And so, as though on its own, a clinical practice resumed and eventually became large. People came from all over the United States. The practice had 2,000 outpatients, which required more than 50 therapists and other employees, a suite of 25 offices, and research and electroencephalographic uh, laboratories. There were 1,000 new patients a year. In addition, there were appearances on radio, on network television shows, as well as, previ as previously mentioned. In 1973, the clinical research was documented in a traditional format in the book Orthomolecular Psychiatry. This work was 10 years ahead of its time and created something of a stir. The overall condition of the nervous system improved slowly. Why do you think that might have improved slowly? Can you see his body is slowly becoming used to 
the energy passing through it now, right? The energy of the spirit passing through it. <coughs> there was a sweet, delicious band of energy continuously flowing up the spine and into the brain where it created an intense se sensation of continuous pleasure. Everything in life happened by synchronicity, involving imperfect harmony. The miraculous was commonplace. The origin of, the, of what the world called miracles was the presence, not the personal self. What remained of the personal me was only a witness to these phenomena. The greater I, deeper than my former self or thoughts, determined all that happened. The states were present that were present had been reported by others throughout history and led, of course, and led to the investigation of the spiritual teachings, including those of the Buddha, enlightened sages, Zhang Huo, and other recent teachers such as Ramana Maharashi, and I can't pronounce the next one. <coughs> <coughs> it was thus confirmed that these experiences were not unique. The Bhagavad Gita was now made complete sense. At times, the same spiritual ecstasy reported by Sri Ramakrishna and the Christian saints occurred. Everything and everyone in the world was luminous and exquisitely beautiful. All living beings became radiant and expressed this radiance in stillness and splendour. It was apparent that all mankind is actually motivated by love, but has simply become unaware. Most lives are lived as though by sleepers unawakened to the awareness of who they really are. People around me looked as though they were asleep and they were and were incredibly beautiful. It was like being in love with everyone. It was necessary to stop the habitual practice of meditating for an hour in the morning and then again before dinner because this would intensify the bliss to such an extent that it was not possible to function. <coughs> an experience similar to the one that occurred in the snowbank as a boy would reoccur and it would become increasingly difficult to leave that state and return to the world. The incredible beauty of all things shone forth in their perfection and where the world saw ugliness there was only timeless beauty. This spiritual love suffused all perception and boundaries between here and there, then and now, or separa all separation disappeared. During the years spent in inner silence, the strength of the presence grew. Life was no longer personal. A personal will no longer existed. The personal lie had become an instrument of the infinite presence and went about and did as it willed. People felt an extraordinary peace in the aura of that presence. Seekers sought answers, but as there was no longer any such individual as David, they were actually finessing answers from their own self, which was not different from mine. Each person of the same self shone forth in their eyes. The miraculous happened beyond the ordinary comprehension. Many chronic maladies from which the body had suffered for years disappeared. Eyesight spontaneously normalised and there was no longer a need for the lifelong biofocals. Occasionally, an exquisitely blissful energy and infinite love would suddenly begin to radiate from the heart towards the scene of some calamity. While driving on a highway, this exquisite energy began to beam out of the chest. As the car rounded a bend, there was an auto accident. The wheels of an overturned car were still spilling. Spinning, the energy passed with such great intensity into the occupants of the car and then stopped of its own accord. Another time, while I was on the streets of a strange city, the energy started to flow down the block ahead and arrived at the scene of an incipient gang fight. The combatants fell back and began to laugh and again the energy stopped. Profound changes of perception came without warning in improbable circumstances. While dining alone at Rothman's on Long Island, the presence suddenly intensified until everything and every person which had appeared as separate or in ordinary perception melted into a timeless universality and oneness. In the motionless silence, it became obvious that there were no events or things that actually, that actually nothing happens because past, present and future are merely artefacts of perception as the illusion of the separate eye began to be subject to the birth and death. As the limited false self dissolved into the universal self of its true origin, there was, this, there was an ineffable sense of having returned home to a state of absolute peace and, and relief from all suffering. It is only the illusion of individuality that is the origin of all suffering. 
that has to be, by the way, one of the most intense untruths I've ever read. But anyway, <laughs> when one realises that one is the universe, complete and at one with all that is, forever without end, then no further suffering is possible. Now, he says all of that, and yet listen to the next few pages. Patients come from every country in the world, and some were the most hopeless of the hopeless. Grotesque writhing, wrapped in wet sheets for transport from faraway hospitals, they came, hoping for treatment for advanced psychosis and grave incurable mental disorders. Some were catonic, many had been mute for years, but in each patient, beneath the crippled appearance, was the shining essence of love and beauty, perhaps so, so obscured to ordinary vision that he or she had become totally unloved in this world. One day a mute catonic was brought into the hospital in a straitjacket. She had severe neurological disorder and was unable to stand. Squirming on the floor, she went into spasms and her eyes rolled back in her head. Does this sound like what you've seen happen here sometimes? <laughs> Some of you have actually experienced these things. Her hair was matted, torn off her clothes and uttered guttural sounds. Her family was fairly wealthy. As a result, over the years, she had been seen by innumerable physicians and famous specialists from all over the world. Every treatment had been tried on her and she had been given up as hopeless by the medical profession. A short, non-verbal question arose. What do you want done with her, God? Then came the realisation that she just needed to be loved. That was all. Her inner self shone through her eyes and the self connected with that loving presence. In that second she was healed by her own recognition of who she really is. What happened to her mind or body didn't matter to her any longer. This in essence occurred with countless patients. Some recovered the eyes of the world and some did not. But whether a clinical recovery ensued didn't matter any longer to the patients. Their inner agony was over. Now he describes now a lot of the things that were happening for others. What I'd like to do is just skip over them and get back to some of the things that were happening to him. Um, yeah. He describes what led to the study of kinesiology. It was the wormhole between two universes, he says. The physical world and the world is the mind and spirit and interface between dimensions. In a world full of sleepers lost from their source, here was a tool to recover and demonstrate for all to see that lost connection with higher reality. This led to the testing of every substance, thought and concept that we would brought to mind. The endeavour was aided by my students and research assistants. Then a major discovery was made. Whereas all subjects went weak from negative stimuli such as fluorescent lights, pesticides and artificial sweeteners, Students of spiritual disciplines who had advanced their levels of awareness did not go weak as did ordinary people. Something important and decisive had shifted in their consciousness. It apparently occurred that as they realised they were not at the mercy of the world, but rather affected by what their minds believed. Perhaps this very process of progress toward enlightenment could be shown to increase man's ability to resist the vicissitudes of existence, including illness. The self had the capacity to change things in the world by merely envisaging them. Now, from now on, he's referring to himself as the self. Right? But later, you'll see there's some very interesting developments that happen to his body. And uh, you'll see what's going on when you understand them. Um, it now appeared that these crucial insights could not only be communicated with the world but visibly and irrefutably demonstrated. So now he's talking about how kinesiology, which is the truth by the way, can demonstrate what's really going on in the physical levels and, uh, and certainly at the soul level too. He said it was time to leave New York with its city apartment and go home and home on Long Island for something more important. It was necessary to perfect myself as an instrument. This necessitated leaving that world and everything in it, replacing it with a reclusive life in a small town where seven, the next seven years were spent in meditation and study. Overpowering states of bliss returned, unsought, and eventually there was the need to learn how to be in the divine presence and still function in the world. The mind had lost track of what was happening in the world at large. In order to do research and writing, it was necessary to stop all spiritual practice and focus on the world of form. Reading the newspaper and watching television to help to catch up on the story of who was who, the major events, the nature of current social dialogue, etc. 
Exceptional subjective experiences of truth, which are the province of the mystic who affects all mankind by sending forth spiritual energy into the collective consciousness, are not understandable by the majority of mankind and are therefore of limited meaning except to other spiritual seekers. This led to an effort to be ordinary because just being ordinary in itself is an expression of divinity. The truth of one's real self can be discovered through the pathway of everyday life. To live with care and kindness is all that is necessary. The rest reveals itself in due time. Commonplace and God are not extinct. And so after a long circular journey of the spirit, there was a return to the most important work, which was to try to bring the presence at least a little closer to the grasp of as many fellow human beings as possible. Now, what happens now is, the, is, is he is in this state now where he's now starting to really demonstrate love, natural love to others, right? So he's starting to come to these awarenesses that he needs to be developed in natural love. And then as he does that, he, he gets through this plate of going through different disciplines and everything to grow in his natural love. And rather than describe a lot of those things, um, I want to describe some of the things that happens to, to, ha happen to him. Suddenly, without warning, a shift in awareness occurred and the presence was there, unmistakable and all-encompassing. So notice how he's constantly having this shift between full awareness and not full awareness, constantly going on, this shift back and forward. There were a few moments of apprehension as the self died and then the absoluteness of the presence inspired a flash of awe. This breakthrough was spectacular, more intense than anything before. It has no counterpart in ordinary experience. The profound shock of, was cushioned by the love that was within the presence. Without the support and protection of that love, one would be annihilated. There followed a moment of terror as the ego clung to its existence, fearing it would become nothingness. Instead, as it died, it was replaced by the self of, as everythingness, the all in which everything is known and obvious in its perfect expression of its own essence. Now, what troubles me about this description, and perhaps we could have a light on, what troubles me about this description is that he's describing something that many people in, and many of you in your own past would have, would have read this and thought, wow, I would love to be in this place, wouldn't you? Right? How many of you would have thought, I would love to be in this place that he's actually describing here? And he's describing it as if it's such a beautiful thing that everyone should obtain for it. You know, everyone should seek. Um, I want to say there's some other things he says here that are really important. Ah, yes, here we go. The ecstasy that accompanies this condition is not absolutely stable. There are also moments of great agony. The most intense occur when the state fluctuates and suddenly ceases for no apparent reason. There is a very good strong reason. His physical body can't cope with the energy that's flowing through it and so there is a disconnection between himself and the spirit. You follow me? In that moment he experiences the agony of going from this place of bliss which is almost a permanent state into the place of where his normal self actually resides. And in, in that experience is terrible agony. Now you imagine what's going to happen when he passes? That state is going to be permanent. That, that's terrifying prospects, right? He says, these times bring on periods of intense despair and a fear that one has been forsaken by the presence. These fools make the path arduous and to surmount these reversals requires great will. It finally becomes obvious that one must transcend this level or constantly suffer excruciating descents from grace. My brothers and sisters, you can never descend from God's grace. Right? So if you experience this kind of experience, you're not descending from God's grace, you're descending from something else. The glory of ecstasy then has to be relinquished as one enters upon the arduous task of transcending duality until one is beyond all oppositions and their conflicting pulls. But while it is one thing to happily give up the iron chains of ego, it is quite another to abandon 
the golden chains of ecstatic joy. It feels as though one is giving up God and a new level of fear arises never before anticipated. This is the final terror of absolute aloneness. To the ego, the fear of non-existence was formidable and it drew back from it repeatedly as it seemed to approach. The purpose of the agonies and the dark nights of the soul, he says, then became apparent. They are so intolerable that their exquisite pain spurs on one to the extreme effort required to surmount them. When vacillation between heaven and hell becomes unendurable, the desire for existence itself has to be surrendered. My <laughs> he describes so accurately the emotions that go on for somebody who's being overcloaking here. And he doesn't realise, unfortunately, what he's actually describing. And the, the problem with, with what he's describing here is that, is that people will read those words and then want to obtain that same level of bliss, not understanding that there is going to be this swing between absolute bliss and absolute abject terror. And the reason why that swing is going to occur is because it's not real. It's a manufactured state by a spirit overcloaking him. Now, um, obviously he has, he has a far greater autobiographical works than this and it'd be quite interesting to read the entire story. But you can see the influence of the spirit at every single stage in his life and how that affects the process that he's going through. And this is the trouble is that uh, this spirit body, the spirit body and the material body of the person who's on earth is totally incapable of handling the energies coming from these higher spirits. And so what happens is it goes through these states of polarity where it goes into states of terror and, and back into its normal, what he calls the ego self and, and, and stays in that place for a while and he has to use his will to move himself back out of that place and back into this other place which is that place of bliss again. And because of not understanding what's really going on, there's this soul desire for absolute bliss driving the addiction. And so it's going to continue for the rest probably of his life and this spirit is going to very much resist him changing his mind on this matter. Right? So it's very, very damaging. Now it is three o'clock I think. Um, so we have one question. Peter, you're dying to ask a question, I can see that. So I'll ask you. There's a mic coming. I'm not dying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keen. You're allowed to be no, keen. <laughs> the, the, the comment I wanted to make was, because I've read all Hawkins' books, he was, until I met you, he was my hero. Yeah. And uh, he's actually, like if you look at, uh, at the, understand, the spiritual understanding of, of, of the planet, He's written up in the who's who of the world as the foremost teacher in the subject of enlightenment. Mm. So that kind of shows how little everybody understands what's really happening mm -hmm. and, and how there's such a, um, like a, a shortage of, of real insight yeah. into the process. And the other thing I wanted to mention was when I was over in uh, India and we were, uh, I, I was, well, all the people were, getting a chance to have an audience with um, Sri Amar and Bhagavan, the mm -hmm. two um, avatars. Um, I, because I was sort of, I don't know, specially chosen, I got to take over all his medicines to him. And so there was a, bi a big box of medicines that I had a, had a driver and everything, and, and I had to deliver his medicines to him so that he could, well, I don't know, so he could have his medicines and he would, be, he would sit in front of the, all the assembled thousands, there were thousands and thousands of people, it was like hundred buses full of people. Mm -hmm. They're all queued up and they'd go into a room as big as this and, and they would sit there up on the stage and they would radiate all this love in that altered state to all the participants who thought it was absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yet, Yet he's got to have he, a need his, he needed his medicines to be able to continue to do that, mm. which kind of gives you an insight into... What's happening behind the scenes? Exactly, and and everybody thought it was like the most awesome. Yeah, yep. Mm. And this is the problem with the misrepresentation of truth. Now, unfortunately, he's not he's not 
even aware of why it's happening the way it's happening. And the spirits who we talk to today, obviously, who are the leaders of the movement, are very aware of why it's been happening and they're quite distressed about the level of untruth that they had been involved in. But, but this is the problem, is that while this kind of possession occurs, there is this automatic acceptance of it as something to, be, to, to desire and to, to actually focus on and want. And I'm well, suggesting to you, please don't do that. Well, he asked me, when I, when I had an audience with him, yeah. I had an audience with him for an hour, yeah. and, and he said, what can I do for you? What, what do you want? And I said, what I would really like is to be able to um, achieve a state of enlightenment. And he said, oh, is that all? And, and then, then he organised a special process for me, which didn't actually work, but yeah. it, was, it was very nice, yeah. where one of the, the, the so-called um, um, oneness, um, the people who are totally overcloaked, yeah. um, did a special, just a one-on-one -on -one process with me where they were attempting to yep. give me that taste of enlightenment, which unfortunately or fortunately didn't actually happen. Exactly. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is where, and, and what we'll do after the break now is that we'll, we'll discuss this more and answer your questions about a lot of this of what's going on historically. Because these things are actually increasing in their intensity on the planet at the moment. And there's a very, very good reason why they are. And the primary reason why they are is because the planet is getting into a better spiritual condition and so therefore is much more easily, many people are much more easily overcloaked by higher spirits than ever before. See, before in history, most people who were overcloaked were overcloaked by lower spirits who caused a lot of damage and a lot of, a lot of def def uh, negative things to occur. And there were very few people historically who were overcloaked by a higher spirit who could deliver to them higher truths. But, but, it, but nowadays, there are literally millions of people on this planet who are in the state uh, where they are able to be overcloaked by spirits of, this, of, of a six-sphere nature or lower, but they will all experience the same kind of experiences as described by David Hawkins until they realise that actually the state isn't real. And what I prefer to have, if perhaps if we could just turn that mic off, Nick, and um, what I'd prefer to see and have is that your state of development is real every step of the way. And that's what our spirit friends who are on the celestial path would love you to experience too. So what we'll do after the break now is uh, if we come back about, what is it, about quarter past at the moment? Five, Five past. If we can come back about 45 minutes and I'd love to answer your questions about these things and how they affect your lives or how they've affected your lives in the past. Thanks guys.